This is a glorious day to be together. Greetings, brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. It is so good to be together to worship God today. I thank you for joining us in our online campus with our living room worship today. I'm Pastor Corey Conran. I pastor at Coopersville United Methodist Church, both our physical location here in Coopersville and our online location here as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for coming together as the body of Christ to worship him today, to rejuvenate our spirits, to be energized, to be equipped for the work of God in this world. As we come to this time of worship today, I want to invite you to, to clear your mind, to, uh, to free your heart. You know, life can be tough sometimes and there's a lot that goes on, but this time, this, this hour we have together to worship God is a time of peace and hope. So let us uh, center ourselves this morning by joining together in prayer. Oh, great and glorious God, we praise you for this day. We thank you for the blessing and the privilege that it is to come to worship, to gather with brothers and sisters throughout this world to worship you, to sing your praises, to hear your word, to hear it preached, to have an opportunity to offer ourselves to you and to respond through acts of service. And today we also thank you for the chance to come together to share in communion. We praise you, Lord, for all that you are. and We pray that you would be glorified and honored through all we do, all that we say, on this day of worship. Amen. As I said, today we're going to be celebrating communion. So if you haven't already prepared, go ahead during our first worship song and go and grab some, some bread or some crackers and some juice, enough for you and all those who are gathered in your household today. And following our message, our, our sermon today, we're going to um, come together in a time of communion. We'll have a short liturgy and we'll be able to receive these elements wherever we're at. So go ahead and grab those now. Also, I'd encourage you to grab your Bible, have that ready. We're going to start digging into some great word in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah today. It might take you a few moments to find it. So grab your Bibles, open it up to Nehemiah chapter one. And as we prepare today, let's um, open our hearts in worship to God through song this morning.
Amen. It is good to join our voices together in singing to God and offering our praises to him. Now we also have an opportunity to offer more than just our words to him, but to offer our lives back to him. Every week, uh, churches around the world, we, we take an offering. We, we collect uh, finances from those that are part of our congregations. And, and we do this for not just to pay our bills. I mean, that's a big part of it, right? But it's not just an act of paying our bills to keep our buildings going, to keep our staff going. Um, our, our offering, our time of giving back to God is an act of faith. We show God our faith by giving him all of who we are. And, and by giving him some of the resources that he's blessed us with, turning it back over to him to do his work in this world, to reach out through the church, through the ministries and the mission projects and, and the outreach and the events and, and the classes and everything else that the church partakes in. We give to these, or, or to these programs, to this ministry, so that people can hear the love of God. So that they can be fed both physically and spiritually. So that we can continue that work that God calls us to, that mission he calls us to be a part of. So today I invite you to give your offering to the work of the church. You can do so by dropping a check in the mail and sending it to our church office here in Coopersville. You can also head online to our uh, safe and secure online giving portal. It's at coopersvilleumc.org slash online dash giving. And there you can go ahead and you can give our regular general giving. You can give to our missions giving. You can specify a specific project or things like that. All of that is capable to be done there in our safe and secure website. As you give today, uh, give cheerfully, give joyfully. That's what God calls us to do, right? To give out of faith, to give out of a desire for people to experience the love of God, to be touched by the ministry and the mission of the church. So as you give today, I want to invite you to join me together as we pray for our offering. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have plans for us that are for our good and for your glory. You said, give and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you, Lord, today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and you continue to supply all our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our soul. May you be glorified today through our act of giving and our faith. And it's in your mighty name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you now to hear the word of the Lord today from Nehemiah. Well, good morning, beloved. Welcome to Sunday. It is so good to see you here today. Today's literature is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. It is the New Living Translation. It is titled, titled, Nehemiah's Concern for Jerusalem. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned fast and prayed to the God of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. It's the beginning of August already. It's, it's, it's insane that we're already into August and we've made it through seven months of this crazy year. 
We've been through a, a metaphoric tsunami of bad news after bad news, it seems, this year. And, and from that, we've seen a myriad of responses. It seems that we've had no shortage of people willing to talk about all that's been going on, to complain about it, to speculate, to, to gossip and offer conspiracy theories up. And, and we've seen so many respond in different ways, you know, with, with fear and anger and, and with so many other very human and, and unfortunately oftentimes very unhelpful ways. So I want to ask you today as we, we begin our study in Nehemiah, how do you typically respond to bad news? You know, when, when you get troubling information, when, when bad things happen, what do you do? Well, some of us, we, we freak out, right? We don't respond well. Others, we, we brush it off or, or we explain it away. And still others will do what they can to, you know, to try to solve the situation or to figure out a way through it if they can't solve it. For some, it leads to anger. And, and for others, it leads to sadness and anxiety or even depression. Others, simply avoidance. But all of us respond to bad news in one way or another because, well, we all have to deal with the reality that life will bring us bad news. As much as we try to avoid it, pray it away or, or ignore it, life is full of troubling times again and again. And if we're honest with ourselves, you know, those responses are more often our go-tos than anything else, including prayer. Too often we, we try to figure things out for ourselves before we think about turning to God, as ashamed as we are to admit that. How we deal with the bad things that come in life is important, and, and the quickness with which we turn to God is also important. Today we start a six-week six message series covering the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Now this text is the, tells the story of Israel's rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Despite hardship and pain, the people of Israel saw firsthand how God fulfilled his promises given to the people during the time when they were exiled from their land. Now during the time of exile, many Jews responded to the continuing bad news this, the same ways that, that we have this year, you know, fear and, and anxiety and anger and, and everything else. Just like now, they saw that it was far too easy to talk about, to, to complain about, and to gossip about all the struggles going on. But just like now, all that talk got them very little if it wasn't accompanied by action. Same for us. And, and trying to find a way through all these struggles of life without bringing God into the equation, well, it, it nets us really poor results. The actions and, and the decisions of a guy named Nehemiah here in the Bible show us what it looks like to turn to God when trouble strikes and, and then to do something about it, to, to act in faith and to help the situation. And we today, I think, have a lot to learn from this Old Testament book as well. So in our Bibles uh, here in the Old Testament, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, they're right next to each other. They're, they're two separate books. But early on in the Jewish Bible, these two books were actually combined into one work, telling one larger story. Now the stories in these books, they, they take place after King Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Babylonian Empire invaded the land of Judah and, and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, taking a large number of Jews, Jewish people into exile. Now Ezra begins his narrative about 50 years after the exile began. And about a year after the Persian Empire came in and they conquered the Babylonian Empire. So now the Jews find themselves in exile under the Persian Empire. And part of the work of the new Persian kings was, was beginning to allow the Jews to, to return to their homeland and begin rebuilding. Ezra and Nehemiah, they tell the stories, three stories of particular leaders who oversaw some of these groups of Jewish people returning to Jerusalem to begin that rebuilding. The book of Ezra uh, begins by telling of Zerubbabel helping to rebuild the temple. Sixty years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to restore the teaching of God's word, that's the Torah. And then a few years later comes the story of Nehemiah with this book that we're starting today, where he returns to Jerusalem to initiate and to oversee the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Now each story in these two books, it, it sees a similar pattern. 
a king of Persia is stirred by God to send someone to Jerusalem and to supply them with all the resources they need for some task of rebuilding. Each of these leaders, when, when they arrive to begin their work, they face heavy opposition and resistance to the rebuilding efforts, which they finally overcome, completing the rebuilding process and ending with a great celebration among the people. Now, at the time of the beginning of this book, Nehemiah is a Jewish exile serving in the Persian Empire as a cupbearer to King Atraxerxes. Now, one day, a man named Hanani, who's, who's Nehemiah's brother, returns to Persia from a visit to Jerusalem. Nehemiah goes to him and, and he wants to know how the community who's returned to Jerusalem in exi from exile, how they're faring, what they're doing. Anani, unfortunately, shares the news that the people in Israel are in great trouble and disgrace and, and that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned by fire. Now, being a man who longs to be with his people again, to, to be in their home in Jerusalem again, Nehemiah's heart breaks and, and he mourns and fasts and prays for several days. Now, it says here in chapter 1, verse 4, that... Um, it, it, that's what it says here in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 that he, he mourns and fasts and prays. See, he received bad news. And how he responds to this bad news gives us several ways that we can respond to bad news well, how, as well. How we can respond to grief and affliction in life. And we do that by seeking God. See, Nehemiah's first response to hearing the bad news that his beloved Jerusalem is in great disrepair, facing attack and, and trouble because of their destroyed walls and gates... Well, his first response is to pray. He doesn't go and tell others. He tells God. He doesn't try to distract himself from the problem. He goes to God. And he casts his anxieties and his cares upon God. When we encounter bad reports and, and go through difficulties in our own life, prayer should be our first response, not our last resort as it often is. How many times have, have we found ourselves at our wits end? You know, tr we've tried everything and nothing seems to work. Nothing is helping. So, so we finally, well, finally we relent and we figure out we probably should pray about it, right? See, prayer should be our first response in trouble, not our last ditch, in, last ditch effort to, to redeem the situation somehow. And in the same way, when we have good news, when, when we experience the blessings of God in our life, prayer with thanksgiving should be our initial reaction as well. So the first thing that Nehemiah did was, was pray. Secondly, it says that he entered a season of seeking God through prayer, fasting, and mourning. He says in, in chapter 1, verse 4, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God in heaven. Now, given the specific dates that are mentioned here in this section, and knowing a bit about Babylonian and Israelite calendars, we learned that Nehemiah didn't just pray and fast for, for a couple of days. But it says that he prayed and fasted and mourned for somewhere between 90 and 150 days. That's, that's three to five months that he spent before God, seeking God through prayer, through fasting. That means, you know, giving up on, on eating and other things for a time in order to dedicate ourselves to God through prayer and, and through mourning, through, through setting in the midst of our pain. Three to five months of that. We live in a culture that, that thrives on the instant. You know, we want things to happen right now, right? We want our packages to arrive on our doorstep in two days. Or, or if we're really lucky, we can order that thing we want today and, and have someone bring it right to our house tomorrow. Streaming and downloading movies right to our phones in seconds rather than having to find a video store to rent it or, or even taking the time to go to a movie theater. We want it now. Uh, Christopher Mother, uh, a writer and a columnist for the Boston Globe, he, he wrote this in an article in 2013. He said, a lot of things that are really valuable take time, but immediate gratification is our default response. It, it's difficult to overcome those urges and be patient and wait for the things to come over time. See, this desire for, for the instant influ influences our spiritual lives as much as it does our daily physical existence. We want what we want when we want it. 
and we're not too keen about having to wait for it. When we experience trials and hardships, we want the answers and the resolution right now, as easily as possible. But the truth of life is that when we are in these times, we must patiently seek God and wait on him. We have to be willing to be led by God, to follow his guidance, to, to seek his will in our situations. And as is often the case, and, and the reason that we tend to give up quickly on waiting for God is we don't often see immediate results when we wait. We often wait and wait, hoping for things to go our way, and we get frustrated when the results don't come on our timetable, in our ways. You know, this is why most New Year's resolutions don't make it past the first couple of weeks of January. We aren't typically people who like to wait for results. But just because we don't see immediate results from waiting before God, from, from our prayers and other spiritual disciplines, we must not give up or quit. We need to persevere to rest before God and, and to trust him as we walk by faith. So Nehemiah, he prayed and he waited. Now next, if, if we continue reading in chapter 1 here with verses 5 through 11, we, we see that Nehemiah confessed his sins and the sins of the people. This is, this is what he said. O Lord God of heaven, the, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey him, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we've sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We've sinned terribly by not obeying your commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember that you told your servant Moses, "If you are faithful to me, I will scatter you among un, if you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exi exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayer of those prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Nehemiah says, I have sinned. My family has sinned. My people have sinned. Confession, it, it's a powerful spiritual practice in our lives, but, but often when we hear the word confession, we have a negative reaction. But confession isn't a negative word, a horrible experience, or, or meant to be a reminder of our failures. Confession is beautiful. The Greek word, it, it's a compound term from the words to speak and, and to end the same. So confessing is simply speaking the same. It's, it's agreeing with God that we have sinned against him and others. It's, it's confirming to God what God already knows about us. Now, I'm not saying that every trial and trouble we face is a result of our sin. Some of our troubles are, yeah, and confession is vital to overcoming those. But other times when, when we seek God in difficult seasons and, and we agree with him and his truth, we humble ourselves before God. Acknowledging that he is God, that we are sinners, and that we desperately need him. So Nehemiah faced his troubles by praying and, and waiting and confessing. And lastly, we see in, in that additional passage here in chapter 1 that he recalls who God is and what God has promised. When we find our heart greatly troubled and our, our circumstances appearing dim, we have to remember how great and amazing God's faithfulness and loving kindness is towards us. In, in verse 5, the word for love here in the Hebrew is the word hasid, which means unfailing kindness, mercy, devotion, steadfast faithfulness. God's love for us is steadfast. That means it, it doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't change based on circumstances or emotions. God loves you and nothing will ever change that. And remembering who God is, that, that he is the God who loves us with an unchanging, steadfast love, well, that allows us to remember his promises and, and, and to trust in them. Whenever we, we go through affliction, through stressful events, seasons of hurt, or, or years like 2020, 
We need to stand firm in the hope of God's promises. That he will never leave us nor forsake us. That he is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. In the Psalms, in Psalm 105, verse 4, it says this. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek him. We overcome grief and affliction by seeking God. And what does God promise will happen when we seek him? Well, I want to invite you now to hear these words of God from Jeremiah 29, verses 12 through 14. Hello, my name is Cindy. Hear these words of God from Jeremiah 29, 12 through 14. In those days when you pray, yeah, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. The steadfast love of God promises that he will hear us when we pray. He will be found when we seek him. What do we have to learn about dealing with bad news from the Old Testament book of Nehemiah? Well, we learn that we overcome grief and affliction by seeking God, by, by praying and waiting before him, by, by confessing our sins and by remembering who God is and trusting in what he promises. Amen. I want to invite you to a time of communion. This is where we, we gather together as the body of Christ to remember what Christ has done for us. And specifically, we remember that last night of his life when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room and he shared with them a meal and, and, and he changed that meal. He changed the importance of what was happening there. And he took elements like bread and wine and he made them for us be symbols of the body and the blood that he was about to pour out for us to sacrifice for us for the forgiveness of sins. So I want to invite you to to make sure you have your elements gathered um, enough for everybody to share and we're going to start because we just talked about this about the importance of coming before God in prayer and in confession. We're going to start our time of communion today with um, a confession and pardon. So I'm going to put these words on the screen and I want to invite you to pray this prayer of confession out loud together as we begin. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now hear this good news, brothers and sisters. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love towards us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. All glory to God. Amen. I'm going to lead us through a communion liturgy here. And I want to invite you to... To let, let us complete the liturgy and then together we'll go ahead and take our elements and and if you have multiple people in your house you can go through and, and serve one another once we finish our liturgy so lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord blessed are you O God who gives your word and Holy Spirit who created all things and called them good in Jesus Christ your word became flesh and dwelt among us through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon your, yourself our sin and our death, and you destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who reigns now with you in glory. And you poured upon us the Holy Spirit, making us people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took the bread that was on the table. He gave thanks to you and blessed it. And then he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took one of the cups of wine from the table. Again, he gave it, or he gave thanks to you, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. 
For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this juice, we may know the presence of the living Christ and we may be renewed as the body of Christ for the world redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast, Lord, at your table forever. It is through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in unity with the Holy Spirit that all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Please receive the communion elements this morning. Body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this gift, the gift of the body and the blood that you poured out for us to forgive our sins, to redeem us from death, and to bring us to new life. We praise you this day that we get to share in this, um, this sacrament of communion. And may we, as, as those redeemed and blessed ones, go and share this meal with others as well so that all may know the love of Jesus poured out. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I want to invite you. Let's, let's join together in prayer as the body of Christ. We, I introduced this last week. This is a, a prayer cloth that, that our church was, was given, gifted um, from a uh, family in our church that was headed to Guatemala this last uh, winter in February. And, and they gave it to us as a, a symbol, as a sign to remember to pray and of our connection with the global church. And so I want now to us to uh, to use this as our as our sign, as our, our symbol of, of remembering to pray for our church, for the global church. So would you join me together now as we, we join our voices in praying? Father God, we thank you for this day, for this opportunity to worship as your people, as your body. The church looks different now than it has in the past, but we praise you, Lord, that we still are your church. We praise you, God, that your church looks so different and unique and beautiful throughout this world. We pray today for your church. We pray for our local congregation, Lord, that you would help us to continue in the work of ministry, that you would help us to continue encouraging one another and walking alongside each other, to building up disciples who make disciples, to reach out, to live, to love, and to serve as you've called us to. We pray for other congregations in our community as well, Lord, that you would bless them and you would encourage them and call them to greater and greater acts of service and love in this world. We pray for the church throughout this world that is seeking to love you and to serve you in situations that, well, we may not even be able to comprehend. But you, Lord, you have all of it in your hands. You are already working on those situations in those places with those people. And God, we praise you for that. And we pray today that your church would trust you, that your church would follow you, that your church would show this world what it means to be loved by you and to live a life that loves you. Father, we pray that you would hear us now as we pray that prayer Jesus taught us so long ago, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. And let us sing about the goodness of God now through song. Brothers and sisters, it has been such a great day to worship with you, to share in the presence of God through his word, through offering, through the act of communion, and through prayer. It is such a glorious day to be the body of Christ and to be together with you. As we close our time of corporate worship today, I just want to share a few announcements with you. The first off is our, our Be the Church Challenge for this week. We're about a month away from school starting, a little less than that now, just a few weeks. And, and our Be the Church Challenge this week is, is schools are in for a crazy year. They've had to make decisions um, on how to do schooling the safest way possible, the best way possible in the midst of our global pandemic. And it has not been easy and it has not been, been without its challenges. And one of the ways that we can seek to be the church this week is to start collecting school supplies. This is something we do every year. It's a need that's always there, but I think it's going to be magnified even greater this year because of what's going on. So please, please start collecting school supplies. If you're here in Coopersville, starting this week, we were gonna have a, uh, a can outside the church building where you can drop in school supplies to be donated any time during the week. You can also bring them to our drive-in services on Sunday mornings at 10. And if you're not in our area, consider buying some school supplies and donating them to your local schools. I guarantee you they will need them and they will appreciate them so very much. And this is just one tangible way that we can together be the church. Also, I just want to remind you about our offering. You can go ahead and, and give to the work of God today. Please make sure that you, you send in your offering to help support the ministries of God through the local church. Now I want to leave you with this blessing, this benediction from the end of 1 Thessalonians. It's one of Paul's letters in the New Testament. And here it says this. So receive this blessing. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Be blessed, everyone, and have a wonderful week.